Okay, so, uh, well, first, uh, thank you uh, to Microsphere organizers uh, for hosting these uh, presentations. And uh, thank you everyone for attending uh, this talk on exploring type level programming in Scala. Uh, my name is Jorge Vasquez and I'm a Scala developer at uh, Scala. So what we are going to discuss about today, first, we're going to take a look at some uh, motivations around type level programming in Scala. Then we're going to cover some background about some important concepts uh, around type level programming. Uh, for example, what are dependent types, uh, path dependent types and abstract type members. And we're going to give some uh, concrete examples to have a more clear uh, idea. And finally, I'm going to talk about some examples of libraries that use type level programming in the Scala ecosystem. So what are the motivations around a uh, type level programming? Uh, well, it turns out that we use Scala for type safety. That's a, a very important feature in the Scala language, but sometimes uh, that's not enough. So I want to show you a concrete example around the Spark Data Frame API. With this Data Frame API, we have lots of potential for runtime bugs. For example, uh, suppose I have a data frame containing data about some tweets from users. So it has several columns. For example, you can see we have a hashtags column that's an array of strings. We have a text column, which is a string containing the, the, mes the message from the tweet, the tweet ID, some place information about the tweet itself, the retweet count, the favorite count, who is the, who's the user uh, who tweeted, uh, what's the user's screen name, and at what timestamp was a tweet uh, published. So, for example, if I have an application and try to select this username column and this tweet column, uh, that, would, that will compile uh, with no problems. But at the moment of running the application, we're going to get an awful Spark SQL analysis exception saying that cannot resolve the username column. And why is that? Well, that's uh, obvious here, because if you take a look to the schema of the data frame, you can uh, realize that we don't have a username column. We have a user column or a user screen name column, but not username. Sadly, uh, the only way to know about this was running the application, maybe in production, and realizing that we had this bug. So that was uh, really unfortunate. What other type of errors we can have? For example, if I try to select this timestamp column and multiply it by 10, if I try to compile this application, I won't have any issues, it compiles. But if I try to run the application, I'll have again another Spark SQL analysis exception saying that it cannot resolve this timestamp times 10 column because there is a data type mismatch. And that's something logic here, because if you take a look to the timestamp column, it has a timestamp type, and we're trying to multiply it by an integer, and that doesn't make sense. But again, sadly, we needed to run the application to realize we had uh, this bug. And we have even worse uh, scenarios. For example, this one, I'm trying here to filter rows in this data frame where the text column which has uh, a string type equals true. And this doesn't fail at compile time and it doesn't fail at runtime. But what, what does it mean comparing this string value with a Boolean value? Who knows? So we can get uh, unexpected results by doing this kind of, of things and Spark won't prevent us uh, of doing uh, this nonsense stuff. This one is even worse than before because here I have this text a string column and trying to divide it by, by a value of 1000 by an integer. And this won't fail at uh, compile time, neither at runtime. And what we are going to get is a column with uh, null values. 
So again, that can cause several awful issues in production that we don't want to happen. So the question here is, can we do better? So there must be a better way of uh, dealing with this kind of uh, awful bugs. So the idea is that Scala has a very powerful type system. So why not use it? So here I have uh, another example, the, well, the same examples of Spark, but using this frameless library that helps us eliminate a lot of bugs at compile time. So here I'm trying to do the same as before. I'm trying to select this username column and this tweet column that don't exist in the original data frame. But this time the compiler will yell at us and will tell us uh, that doesn't even compile because we get this compilation error that looks a little cryptic if these errors come from the shapeless library. But basically what it says here is that there is no column named username. And that's true. We have just user or user stream name. The difference here is that this error happens at compile time and not at runtime. So we are going to need to fix this to being able to run the application. Here we have, again, this example of multiplying the timestamp column by 10. But in this case, the compiler will yell at us again and will tell us, what are you doing? You cannot apply this multiply method to a item string and an integer value. So again, we have to fix uh, this bug so the application can compile. And also comparing this text column of type string with a value of type true will fail at compile time. And the compiler will yell at you again and say, why are you doing this to me? Because you can compare this uh, string value with that uh, Boolean value. That doesn't make uh, sense uh, at all. And finally, this case, which previously gave us a, a column with just no values, would work. The compiler will tell us, don't even think about that because it doesn't make sense to divide a string value by an integer value. In conclusion, what we can say? We can say that type level programming, uh, by, which is the techniques that are used in libraries like Frameless, uh, lets you eliminate bugs at compile time instead of having to wait until we run the application and we see the errors at a uh, runtime. So the compiler is your friend and learn how to learn how to use it, you must. So uh, that's the advice from Master Yoda here. So type level programming has uh, a lot of different several techniques but our focus today will be in just one of them, and that is dependent types. Dependent types are the heart of type level programming in Scala, so we are going to concentrate in that uh, today. So what are dependent types? Dependent types are types that depend on values. So the idea is that uh, with dependent types, we can remove the usual separation between the type and uh, value words. For example, uh, if we have an X value and we say, well, when this value is less than 500, I want the result to be a string. And if it is greater than 500, I want it to be a Boolean, I don't know. So having a type depending on some value, that's dependent types. And that's really great because it allows us to do things that we cannot do uh, without uh, dependent types. Scala is not a fully depend dependently typed language. However, it supports some form of dependent types, which is called path dependent types. And the question now is how we can define path dependent types. So, the idea is that uh, in Scala, we can define nested components. For example, you can have a class inside a trait, or you can have a trait inside a class, etc. So, for example, here I have a trait foo that has inside 
a nested component, a trade bar, and this will help us. Well, this is uh, this means that bar will be a path dependent type. And what uh, does that mean? For example, here I'm creating here two instances of the foo trade, foo one and foo two. Here I'm creating some values a and b, and here this type annotation says that I want a to have the type of any bar inside of any foo. That means this uh, hashtag uh, symbol here. So here, for example, I'm creating a new foo1.bar instance, and, and I'm storing it inside of A, and uh, that works OK. Uh, here I'm doing the same. I'm creating foo2.bar and storing it inside of B. That works. The compiler uh, will not complain. But here, you can see I'm creating this C value. And here, the type is different than, than before. I'm saying here that the C value should be anything, any bar that's inside the full one instance. So that's different from before, because here I was saying this A value can be any bar inside of any foo. Here I'm being more specific. I'm saying any bar inside this instance foo one. So here, I'm creating just a new foo1.bar instance, and that works OK. But what happens here? Here I have a D value, and I'm saying it should store any bar inside the foo2 instance. But I'm trying to assign it a foo1.bar. So this bar inside foo1 is not the same bar inside foo2. So that will cause a compiler error. And the compiler will yell at us and tell us that we require a foo2.bar, but it found a foo1.bar. So that's why this bar is called a path dependent type, because depending on the instance uh, that contains it, it will be a completely different type. Another useful tool in Scala is uh, abstract type members. Uh, these uh, are members, are types that we don't know yet, and we can, that we can define uh, later. For example, here I have a trade bar, and inside of it, I have a type T. But here you can realize this type is not defined. I don't know exactly what is this type, but Scala allows us to do this. So the idea is that we can define later what this abstract type member inside the bar trade uh, will be. So for understanding this better, let's take a look to some concrete examples. First, I have this example about merging files. So the idea is that we need to define a merge function, which will take first a list of files, the list of files that we want to merge, then a merge strategy that can be uh, three strategies. It can be single, meaning that we want to merge all these files into a single one, multiple, meaning that we don't really want to merge these files. We want to keep them as a, a list of separate files. And we have this known strategy. That means that we don't really care about these files. We are going to discard them and do uh, something uh, after that. And also, this merge function should receive a callback function. This callback function is basically what we want to do with the files after they have been merged. So if the single, if the merge strategy is single, that means that the result of merging will be a single file. So the callback function should expect that single file. In the case the merge strategy is multiple, that means this list of files hasn't been merged. So this callback function should expect that list of files. And in case the, the merge strategy is known, that means we are going to discard this list of files. We don't care about them. So in that case, the callback function should expect a unit value. So here you can realize that we are going to need path dependent types because according to the merge strategy, which is single, multiple, or none, the input type of this callback function uh, will, will be different. 
In, a, in some cases, it will be just a file. In others, it would be a list of files or a unit. So well, how can we define that in Scala? So here I have this merge strategy, uh, some type. So I have a trait merge strategy. And inside the companion object, object I have the specific uh, cases for this merge strategy. The interesting part here is that inside this merge strategy trait, I have this output abstract type. So here we are using uh, abstract type members from Scala. And later here in the specific cases of merge strategy, I'm defining what this output type will be. So here it was an abstract type, but here in each one of the specific cases, I'm defining a, the concrete type of this output. So if the merge strategy is single, the output will be just a file. If it's multiple, the output will be a list of files. And if the merge strategy is known, the output type of the merging process will be just a unit value. So here you can see path dependent types in action. Also here I have an auxiliary function, merge files, that uh, we, will, we will use for merging this list, a list of files in just a single file. It will be just an auxiliary function that I don't care right now about the implementation that is not important uh, for now. So here I have the merge function that was requested uh, at the beginning of the example. So we need a list of files. We need a merge strategy and we need a callback function. The type of the callback function is the interesting part here. If you see, you can uh, realize that the input type of the function is the output type of this merge strategy. So here, this type depends on the merge strategy. And that's why we have a path dependent type here. And we're simply going to return any value of type t. This function will be polymorphic. That means that once we have merged our files, uh, we can do anything with, the, with them and return any value of type t. And here is the implementation. So if the merge strategy is single, we just call this function f with the result of merge files. The result of this merge files function is just a single file. So here we're calling f with a file. If merge strategy is multiple, we are calling it with this, this list of files. So it's different because here uh, we're calling it with a single file, but here we're calling it with a list of files. And the merge strategy, if the merge strategy is known, I'm calling it with a, a unit value. So that's different too. So the, here is pretty interesting because we can call f with a different types, not just with one. Unfortunately, uh, this implementation is not complete yet. Uh, Scala will complain, uh, the Scala compiler will complain and give us, a, give us some compilation errors. And that's why in this implementation, Scala cannot uh, really infer that for this case, merge, merge strategy dot output will be just a file, for this case, a list of files, and for the third case, a unit value. So we need to give it some more help to be able to uh, succeed in compilation. So here I have the final version of this merge function. I've added some more information to this merge strategy. So now I'm saying this merge strategy has a type of merge strategy, but the type output will be some type O. So I'm giving this additional information to the Scala compiler. And now this callback function will receive this O type here, which will be the output of merge strategy. And after this, the compilation will succeed. So after we have our merge uh, function, if we call it with a merge strategy of single, our callback will receive a single file. If it's multiple, we, uh, the callback will receive a list of files. And if it's known, it will receive a unit. And all of these cases will compile successfully. But if we try to create, pass a callback here to the single strategy, if we pass it a list of files, 
compilation will fail because it doesn't make sense. It just expects a single file. So this is great because it gives us more type safety. Otherwise, if we don't have uh, these path dependent types, uh, most probably we'll have a callback that always receives a list of files. And the programmer will have to be very careful if it's passing a, a single strategy, it will have to remember uh, in his mind that uh, this, list of, this list of files will just contain one file. So uh, this is better. Here, the compiler will guide us towards uh, the most appropriate solution for each case. Here we have a second example. This is a, a modification of the first one. So here, instead of merging files, we are going to merge elements of any type. So we have the same merge function, but here we receive a list of elements instead of a list of files. So here we have our merge strategy. It's almost the same as before, but here our output type will become polymorphic. Before this output type was a simple type, but here is a type constructor that expects a, a, a type. So for example, if the merge strategy is single, that means that the output, for example, if this A is a file, the output will be a, a file. If the strategy is multiple and we're trying to merge files, meaning this A will be a file, the output will be a list of files. And in case of none, we don't care about the type of elements we want to merge. That's what this parameter here in output represents. We don't care about that. That's why I'm using here an underscore. And the output type in, this, in that case will be unit. It doesn't matter which type of elements uh, I'm trying to merge because I'm just going to discard them. And here, similarly to what I had before, I have a merge elements auxiliary function that receives a list of elements and returns an element. And here I don't care about the concrete implementation. So here we have our merge function. On this case, it receives a list of elements of type E. It receives a merge strategy where the output type, which is a type constructor in this case, which expects elements of type A, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it's going to be some type O that receives some elements of type A. And this callback function, in this case, will receive a O on the, of an E. It means that given this output type is a type constructor, if I apply it to the E type, which is the type of elements, this O of E will give us the input type to the callback function. And we're going to return any, any type T e, uh, as before. So here, the implementation is pretty much the same as in the first example. And the great thing about this is that now we can merge anything, not just files. So in this case, I'm merging a list of strings. So if the merge strategy is single, the callback will expect just a single string. If it's multiple, if it will expect a, a list of strings. And if it's known, it will just expect a unit value. So in conclusion, path-dependent types are the heart and soul of a Scala type system. They, they will help you to improve compile time type safety. And by the way, uh, the name of Doty, uh, the compiler for Scala 3, uh, Doty comes from dot calculus, and dot calculus is basically path-dependent types. So uh, that's something uh, pretty interesting to know. Now let's mention some example libraries that use type level programming. For example, we have Shapeless, a very, very known library, very popular library for generic programming, where we have generic product types named H lists that allows us having lists of uh, whose elements have different types, but it's more powerful than just having a list of N. We have also generic some types. We have Frameless, that's the library I've mentioned before, for adding expressive types for Spark. We have Refined that gives us refinement types. So this library is great because uh, instead of having, for example, a value of type integer, 
you can have an integer whose uh, that's between uh, 50 and 100, for example. So having types with uh, more restrictions at compile time. And another library that's in progress of being developed is ZO SQL that will allow us, allow us to do type safe SQL queries. So uh, that's uh, another library that uses a lot of strategies of type level programming, including path uh, dependent types. So here are some references if, if you want to, to go deeper into type level programming. Uh, here are some articles and uh, talks that I've uh, read that are, this talk is based on. For example, you have this dependent types in Scala article by Yao Li. Uh, you have type level programming in Scala step by step. It's a blog series by Luigi Antonini. Very, very uh, useful information. The Type Astronaut's Guide to Shapeless Book is the book of Shapeless by Dave Cornell which has a lot of interesting ideas around type level programming. And also you can learn more about uh, the shapeless library itself. And finally, a very nice uh, talk by Brian Clapper around an introduction to Apache Spark with Frameless, if you are more interested in knowing about Frameless. So a special thanks to Microsphere uh, organizers for hosting this presentation and to John DeGos for guidance and support on this presentation. And thank you for attending. I hope uh, this uh, presentation has been useful for you and uh, motivates you to explore more about uh, type level programming in your own code basis. So if you want to contact me, here is uh, my Twitter, uh, my GitHub, and my email at Scalag. So if you have any questions about this presentation, you can also ask, ask me here. So thank you.